All right, welcome to this week's Ronin Seminar. This week we have John S. Wilkins, who is going to talk to us about uh, species, the evolution of the idea, which is set up to commemorate the publication of the second edition of his book of the same title. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Wilkins. I did my PhD at um, the University of Melbourne in 2004. Uh, I'm late to being an academic uh, in the sense that I was 48 before I got my postdoc. So I'm now semi-retired, which means that I get to write whatever I like without anyone telling me otherwise. Uh, I do a little bit of casual teaching at the University of Melbourne. I've, I've uh, worked at the University of Queensland, the University of Sydney, uh, in Australia, um, never worked overseas. So when I did my uh, PhD, I was writing about uh, the philosophy of the species concept, and I'm sure many of you will be very familiar with um, a, a lot of that literature, particularly the uh, David Hull and Michael Gieselin idea that species are individuals. And I wasn't actually adding anything of any great uh, note to the debate until I decided that I would spend a couple of chapters in the middle of my thesis just filling in a bit of the history of the idea of species, which immediately ran up against the problem that pretty much everything that had been said by Meyer, by Gieselin, uh, by Hull and a bunch of other people since around about... Um, uh, 1965, which by that stage was um, uh, 40 years previously um, to, the, to the thesis, uh, turned out to be historically unsupportable. And that sort of blew me away. And so the species uh, thesis, which I really wanted to call the origins of theses, but they wouldn't let me, became a history of the idea of not just species the concept but also the ways in which people had been uh, selling different concepts such as the biological species concept and more recently uh, the phylogenetic species concepts and so on. So um, what I'd like to do today is outline the, um, the basic argument of the, uh, the book which it has to do with what uh, I and several other historians independently especially Polly Windsor, uh, uh, who was at University of Toronto, I think. She's retired now. Polly uh, has been a critic of uh, the Maya Hull uh, story that species before Darwin had essences and so forth. So uh, I'd like to talk about that, uh, the, the essentialism story and how that plays out. I'd like to talk about the different varieties of essentialisms because the word is thrown around without very much in the way of um, cross connections between the different areas. And there's often uh, a real problem with the way that people connect these concepts. Finally, if we have the time, um, I'd like to talk about something that's novel in the second edition. And, and I find it really quite interesting. Initially, I thought that the, the very concept of species was a philosophical one that came out of Neoplatonism in the 16th century. As you may or may not know, the first person to define species, the word, in the context solely of the living world uh, was John Ray in 1687. And, and uh, I make quite a bit of how Ray defines species and how it's been uh, used since. But what I discovered in revising the book was that, in fact, Shortly before Ray, there was what I call the logistics tradition of trying to fit all the kinds, which is either genus or species in Latin, of uh, living organisms onto Noah's Ark. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. But fundamentally, the reason that we have species concepts is because we wanted to uh, define the fundamental kinds that could fit on the Ark logistically. Uh, and I find it interesting that uh, such a pr um, primary concept of uh, modern biology, which is argued to be a level of organisation, actually comes out of theological and logistical uh, considerations uh, 
about uh, Noah's Ark. So we'll get to that. Right, so this is the first of the three sections, essentialism story. The essentialism story basically ran like this. So before we had um, Darwin came along and fixed our brains about all sorts of things, he um, showed us that uh, uh, species could change, that they had no essences, um, uh, as everybody had thought due to Aristotle or Plato or the Bible. Um, and the view was, according to the essentialism story, that Linnaeus had been influenced by Aristotle um, and Darwin has given us a completely new philosophy. This is very much uh, Ernst Meyer and Michael Gieselin's views on the evolution of species. Now, the problem is that what people thought before Darwin is very much like what Darwin thought. Uh, moreover, what people ascribe to pre-Darwinians is also something that Darwin himself held. And I'll, I'll explain that in some detail, and particularly in the book. But this is the fundamental essentialism story, or e-story, as it's sometimes called. Uh, so I wanted to revise it. First of all, Ernst Meyer would often talk about the typological uh, view of species uh, and that this somehow licensed the idea that species had essences. I'll get on to what an essence is in a minute. But if you look at the literature, what you find is that people were talking about types in ways that clearly were not essentialistic. For example, um, if you look at the work of William Hewell, in his uh, History of the Inductive Sciences, when he talks about biological classification, he doesn't talk about there being an essence to a genus or a species. He talks about there being a type that things in that genus or species closely approximate or not. So Meyer conflates what are fundamentally um, two quite distinct ideas. Moreover, Meyer seemed to think that uh, the use of morphology to define species it was the same thing as species fixism or creationism. And yet he himself, when he defined species, would use the morphology of specimens to identify them. But he gave it a, a, a cover in that he thought, okay, what I'm doing is I'm defining one member of a population and then extending it out from that. Uh, but that's what people were doing before Darwin. So that doesn't play either. And I argue that with the possible exception of Louis Agassiz at, um, uh, in America, uh, nobody was actually an essentialist in the relevant sense. And I'll get back to what that means in the second section. Before around 2000. In other words, essentialism is a very novel, modern view about species. It's not something that uh, appeared before Darwin. In fact, arguably, oh, sorry, that should be 1900, by the way, not 2000. Arguably, uh, it's a response to Darwin, not a, um, a precondition for Darwin's work. Darwin fundamentally held to the same view of species that Cuvier, who was very influential, Linnaeus and Ray and various other predecessors did, that it was fundamentally something where progeny resembled their parents through heredity and that members of species were uh, generatively created. That is to say, they didn't just pop into existence or come from another species, views that were popular in the uh, Middle Ages, but that they had to have inherited their views from their parents, uh, their appearance from their parents. So a couple of philosophical issues. There's only one species concept. This is a philosophical point. There are many conceptions, or as I like to think of them, definitions of what that concept is. If it weren't like that, then uh, specialists who talk about this or that species concept wouldn't actually be talking about the same thing. Uh, what they're trying to do and what the whole um, unit unitary notion of a species might be is an argument about which definition best matches what the biologists themselves are doing. Ernst Meyer had a distinction between species as taxa, a taxon being 
Homo sapiens, Canis familiaris, and the category of species. But I think that's actually fairly uh, confusing. However, it does point out one thing, and that is that a conception of species may in fact be something that applies only to local taxa. That is, if you are a specialist in mosses, then maybe there's a conception of species that works really well for mosses, but may not work really well for mammals or microbes or you know, something else. Uh, so a species concept can be something which is univocal, that is, it has one meaning, this is, uh, for example, very common with those like uh, Jerry Coyne and H. Um, uh, Allen Orr who argue that Maya's biological species concept, suitably modified for the modern era, is the one true species concept. Or it might be that the term species is a polysemic uh, semantic word. That is to say, it's a word which has uh, a number of related meanings, but they don't fully overlap. It's, it's a family resemblance concept, as we call it in philosophy. So um, the core of the species problem, per se, is how they choose which of these conceptions from these related meanings that apply really well for their organisms and how well that generalizes outside their group of organisms. Right, so what is a species? Right, the species problem is actually a fairly new one. Uh, you don't find much in the literature before about 1900 when people started to argue for the first time that Darwin didn't believe in the reality of species. Darwin did believe in the reality of species and says so explicitly in several places. What he says is they're very, very hard to define because they're basically, according to him, more permanent versions of varieties. With the rise of Mendelian genetics around 1900, people started to say, aha, we have an answer for what species are. In other words, species become a theoretical category of genetics. Only trouble was, every attempt to do that by Johansson and various other people failed rather poorly, particularly when they started to realise that crossovers in, uh, you know, of uh, genetic material at reproduction could cause a wide variety of genetic uh, constitutions. Before Mendelian genetics, the problem that people were dealing with with species, and in particular the problem Darwin was dealing with, had to do with the causal processes of the origination of species. So um, attempts to define species in terms of genetic sets was the first attempt to give a theoretical definition of what a species was in terms of some operational biological science. Nowadays, uh, people are trying to do it in terms of uh, developmental suites, that is developmental uh, systems that generate the same outcomes, you know, in vagination, in, in the zygote and so on, and also genetic coalescence. That is to say, a species is something which you can get a coalescence of uh, the various genetic haplotypes, what have you, all the way back to some founding population. This also doesn't always work. All right. So is species a rank in the world? Is there something objective about it? I argue that there isn't. If there are multiple definitions or conceptions of species that apply to different sorts of organisms, then the rank of species is not something that's objectively out there in the real world. Moreover, I argue that there's no need for species in any biological uh, specialization. For example, there's no need for species in genetics, right? If anything, uh, species is something genetics is supposed to be able to explain. It's not actually a category in genetics, nor is it in ecology where it's the uh, ecological role or the niche that is occupied that, that uh, people talk about when they're talking about species, but species are not that niche or that role, okay? So there's no theory in biology in which species are required. Now, that's a rather radical view argued for in some detail in the book and also in a paper that was published last week uh, by Brent Mishler from the University of California, Berkeley, and myself, uh, in which we argued that um, uh, the very notion of species is something that isn't needed in biology. Uh, it's called um, The Hunting of the Snark, S-N-A-R-C, uh, and it's in uh, philosophy, theory, and practice in biology. It's online and open source, so if you want to go hunting that, you can. 
Is a species a phenomenon? Here's where I think it gets interesting. I argue that species are phenomena, that is to say, they're things in need of explanations. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a uni uh, unitary sense of what sort of phenomenon that might be in biology. We know that living things come clustered together. We know that some of them are sexual and the, the reason they cluster together, is, cluster together is because they preferentially breed with each other. But if you define species in terms of the biological species concept, for example, then every time you find hybridization between what are considered good species by the uh, biologists, uh, what you find is that there's hybridization going on and that challenges the very notion of whether or not that cluster is a species or just part of a species cluster or something like that. There's a big argument at the moment about whether the uh, hominid species sense probably about hom homo ergaster onwards is a species, a species cluster or, you know, something else. Uh, because we're getting uh, obvious evidence of introgression of genes between the different species and populations. So consider, um, to, to explain what I mean by a phenomenon, let's have a look at uh, mountains. Uh, now, I live in Australia, which is a very old tectonic plate, and our mountains are very tired, very small, and wouldn't even be considered hills in uh, the Himalayas or the Rockies. Nevertheless, they're real enough in the sense that if you want to get to the other side of one, you've got three options. You climb over it, you go around it, or you dig through it. And I would say that for government work, that's good enough uh, uh, for objectivity. So a mountain is something which calls for an explanation. So what you do is you explain it in terms, that's a shield uh, mountain, that's a, um, a volcanic uh, craton or whatever, uh, but the explanations are in terms of the objects of geological theory. Mountain itself is not. It's a phenomenon that the uh, geological theory is brought in to explain. Species are likewise the same sort of things. Uh, in my view, they call for explanations. They are not themselves explanatory. Uh, here I'm disagreeing with a uh, uh, biologist in California by the name of uh, 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 Kirk Fitzhugh, who thinks they are explanations, but that's another debate and another talk sometime. So my view is they're a phenomenon of a clustering of properties, of lineages, of genes and organisms, of life cycles, developmental processes, of haplotypes, genes, ecotypes, of just about anything that counts as evidence in biology. And you look at these things and you say, on balance, this is something that is an obvious uh, clustering of properties and it calls for an explanation why have those things clustered that way right and that resolves a lot of the species problem because no longer are you trying to find the one true theoretical definition of species it raises another problem and the other problem is how is it that we identify this cluster and not say a haplotype group in a, in a uh, mildly isolated population uh, as the thing that calls for explanation uh, and to which you apply species. And the answer to that is it doesn't matter anymore. Right? Species is something that we fundamentally look at, say that, that's very interesting. It's a, it's a statement about us and how we relate to the data and to the objects out there in the world. Okay. So let's think a little bit about uh, essences. Essence is a very odd word in that there are probably as many different ways to define essence as there are people who have tried, uh, in which regard it's not terribly unlike species. But when Aristotle introduced the term, he didn't actually have a term for it. He called it the what it is to be something. Uh, because he was looking for causal explanations of general categories. He was saying, what is it that makes all men men? I apologise for the gender-specific term, but he wasn't as woke as we are today. So essentialisms uh, became part of the, the Western mindset. And these days there are four distinct essentialisms and it's very important not to get them conflated because if you do get them conflated, they end up, uh, you end up transporting problems in one domain to another domain where it doesn't have to be. So uh, I would say that cultural essentialism, which is what 
is often spoken about in the context of race uh, is not the same as psychological essentialism, which is where children have um, the idea that there's something that makes a, a living object persist as a living object, even though it changes. Philosophical essentialism, we'll get onto that. That's um, about definitions fundamentally. And biological essentialism, what could that be? And I'll come back to it. They overlap and they sometimes fail to coincide in their sort of core meanings. So there are some things that are more or less common to essentialism. Shared properties, uh, particularly abstract properties, which is what Aristotle was talking about. Fundamentally, the properties of words about things, names, uh, causal properties. John Stuart Mill introduced this idea in the uh, late 19th century, around about the time Darwin was writing, actually. Mostly shared properties or types. Remember I said that types and essences are not the same thing. So Hewell argued, for example, that there was a type specimen, a type species of roses that the entire genus Rosa was grouped around, but that not every species in that genus shared the properties of. So there were no unique sets of properties to roses and only roses, but they were more or less closely approximating the type species. This was very, very common, although I think Huell was probably one of the first people to put that out there. Uh, shared structure, you know, morphology, we're quite familiar with that, and also shared meanings of words, right? So definitions, uh, which is not something that really has um, a lot of biological purchase. I once met um, uh, John Maynard Smith, and he apparently used to say to people, he would, be, he would front up to cafeteria conversations with his students and uh, colleagues and say things like, uh, if this is about words, I will go, but if this is about the world, I will stay. Uh, in other words, he wasn't interested in purely uh, semantic definitions. Uh, and that, of course, gets to what philosophers call denotation, which is where a general term denotes some things in the world. So is this, you know, is, does unicorn denote something in the world? Well, it might do if you're going to include rhinoceros species, but otherwise, no. And that's the sort of essentialism that is very abstract and the sort of thing that people think about when they think about philosophers being really dumb. Uh, and talking about silly stuff. So let's have a look at them. Cultural essentialisms. This is the one that uh, causes, I think, the most problems. Uh, fundamentally, it's the idea that people or populations or cultures have an underlying um, set of properties that, that def explain why its members do things. So if you talk about Western civilization, you're implying that there is some sort of uh, set of core values which are shared oh, by everybody in the West that those horrible others don't share. And uh, you can see where that might end up. And it's, it's uh, the one that is uh, most commonly applied to uh, race uh, discussions, particularly in the United States. Psychological essentialisms are a different sort of thing. Um, it, they're, they're related to an extent, but particularly Susan Gelman in her work on um, young children and their their uh, uh, developmental processes of, of learning about things. Around about the age of two, I think, children start to think that there's some underlying nature that means that when the you know, object goes behind a screen and then reappears uh, in slightly different format, it's the same thing because the underlying nature hasn't changed. Big literature on that, and it's not, I think, something that really goes deeply to uh, taxonomic essentialism that I'll talk about in a sec. Philosophical essentialism, look, we, we've all been exposed to this at some point. Whenever anyone says, before you can have an argument, you have to define your terms, that's a philosophical essentialism. Uh, and I would say it's probably completely irrelevant to the ground level work of biology. It's not irrelevant to the philosophical discussions about biology, but it's not something I think that really has great play in the way biologists do their taxonomy. So let's have a look at that. How much of this affects biology? When have biologists taken philosophers at their word? I would say not very often. Uh, when biologists do use philosophers like 
popper or what have you, they, they only pick the bits that they like and that they can use in biological debates. So uh, it doesn't seem to me that uh, biology follows philosophy. If anything, philosophy is, is uh, dragooned into service by biologists. Historically, you can look at the world and say, you know, from the Myrian perspective, and, and you can't see anything else but essentialism as you look back. Because you see Linnaeans talking about essential characters and you talk about, uh, you see people talking about the essence of this or that type of organism. But it's not the essentialism that Meyer thought it was. Because form, class, essence, kind, group, all these words are vernacular terms as well as philosophical terms. And what the Myrians did was to take philosophical terms as the meanings of the words used by biologists. Uh, but, for example, essential character in uh, the Linnaean scheme just means the key term or the key character that you're using to define a class. It doesn't mean that the class is constituted by the essential character. It's a diagnostic tool, in other words. So finding the terms in the pre-Darwinians doesn't mean that pre-Darwinians were biological essentialists. It just means they used ordinary terms. And interestingly, John Locke pointed this out about the time that John Ray, a friend of his, defined species in a biological context for the first time. Okay? All right, so what seems to bug Meyer and Hull and Giesel and this taxonomic or taxic essentialism. And as I say, they're not psychological, semantic, philosophical, or cultural essentialisms necessarily, although people do do that. I'd say there's no evidence of substantive taxic essentialism at any time in biology, now or then. Not before Darwin, not after Darwin. Once you take off Meyer's essential spectacles and realise that a lot of the evidence that he's calling into play is actually debates in philosophy or debates in psychology or debates in cultural theory, not debates in biology as such. So why is the myth there? Well, I call it a myth, and that might seem like um, I'm having a go at biologists, but I don't think so. It's, it's a term in anthropology, a narrative and explanation that organizes the community. And as you look at biologists, you see they do organize into communities. There are cladists, there are Mendelians, there are uh, molecular biologists, uh, molecular geneticists versus field biologists. I mean, basically, like any science, biology is a set of communities because it's done by human beings and human beings live in communities. Okay, but the essentialism myth was constructed partly deliberately, but mostly I think unconsciously uh, in order to serve polemic interests, particularly Ernst Meyer and George Gaylord Simpson in, at the time of the maturation of the uh, modern synthesis around the mid sixties or so. It's a fallacy of composition in the sense that because they see words being used, they generalise from that to people being uh, having a, a shared f uh, philosophy that those words might imply. Uh, as I argue in the book, that's not the case. All right, so what's the harm of this? Terry Pratchett used to talk about uh, teaching as lying to children because you can't, for example, teach five-year-old's relativity theory. So you have to tell them a very simplistic story about how things fall, why they weigh, what they do. And uh, as their education develops, what you find is that you have to refine those lies until they approximate the harder asked um, truth that you would get in um, a seminar on you know, relativity and quantum theory or something like that. So it's a kind of necessity to talk about essences in that way. Also, because it's a shared conception in our culture, such terms help you to sell it to the public, right? To teach them that the essence of being a species is to be able to interbreed and so forth. It's a very useful simplification. But it does lead to gotchas. Um, it leads to people like creationists and anti-conservationists, such as exist in the EPA in America at the moment. And if they find that biology is not as neat as the, the, the lying to children story might give to you, 
they then feel empowered to go away and say, ha, ah, you know, these scientists, they don't know anything, so we don't have to listen to them. Uh, it, it is, a, a, I think, a problem. But the main pro harm of something is it causes failures of inference. If you are selling the essentialism story and you conflate types and essences, it will actually lead to biologists conflating types and essences and abandoning types, which makes it very difficult for them to deal with the sorts of uh, work that was done before we became um, enlightened at some point. Uh, so I think that, you know, bad history leads to bad science in the short, uh, long term. So philosophical implications. Are tax are never considered as essences? Well, no, uh, that's not the case. Because, for instance, if you find a clonal standard uh, which is unique, um, then its genome basically is an essence. So, uh, you know, pure asexual organisms can be defined in terms of their genetic and and uh, developmental resources. Uh, I'm not saying no, nothing is ever ha, ever has an essence. Everybody thought tax were the types, um, and nobody held the tax uh, historical individuals per se until the idea that species are historical individuals was introduced by. Uh, Gislin and Hull in the 1960s and 70s. But class, when you talk about class terms, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a philosophical class. And even in philosophy, uh, we don't always mean that a class is something that has any, a definition or an intention with the letter S. If we're talking about things that have family resemblances, which is Wittgenstein's argument. I'll go on in great detail. Uh, in the uh, second edition of my book about that. Natural kinds is something that philosophers also talk a lot about. Um, and this was a term that was invented by John Venn of Venn diagrams, but he didn't mean what uh, we now mean by it. This is due to uh, John Stuart Mill. But in biology, when you talk about a natural kind, you mean a biological kind, and it doesn't have to be the kind of kind that if that Mill defined and that we've been talking about in philosophy ever since. And here I'm talking to philosophers. We've got to take seriously what the scientists are doing rather than trying to impose prior philosophical terms of art. Mill changes the subject about what a kind was. And prior to John Stuart Mill, 1870s or thereabouts, what a biologist thought about a kind was what a philosopher thought about a kind because philosophers were taking their cue from the biologists and the mineralogists and so forth. Okay. Huell didn't. Uh, he continued to classify by types. And recently there's a thing called a homeostatic property cluster kinds, which I'm very um, uh, amenable to by Richard Boyd. And uh, what Boyd talks about is that there are causal processes that cause things to cluster together, right? Now, if you apply that to species, then, you know, a particular species, Homo sapiens or whatever, has uh, some causal processes that keep it clustering more or less the same. All right, so um, this is the thing that I found in um, the second edition historically. It's my major revision. I've always thought that, you know, Christians used the Bible as um, a sort of textbook of science. What surprised me was that they didn't uh, for most of their history, uh, right up until about the 14th or 15th century, uh, the Bible was regarded as a series of stories that you would take uh, analogical meaning away from and not actually treat it as science. And, and educated Christians would, you know, the, the principle was they would take the Bible seriously to begin with until the facts of the matter showed them otherwise. And you can see this play out, for example, in the Galileo trial. Uh, he was told that if he simply said, look, it's a hypothesis, but we'll stick with the Bible's interpretation until and unless science shows us otherwise. And Galileo said, no, no, it still moves, and basically got himself into trouble for that. In the context of species, uh, something happened around the time of the Reformation. And what's really interesting is it happened both in the Catholic Church as well as the Protestant Church. 
we expected the Protestants to be literalists about the Bible, uh, and they were, um, Luther in particular. But what we didn't expect was that the Catholic tradition, which had previously always seen the Bible as having four levels of interpretation, only one of which was the literal meaning of the text. We started to see uh, people, and I'll get into these guys in a sec, um, they, we started to see changes in the way Catholics handled the Bible. So now they were starting to think of the, the logistical problems of sticking all kinds of things onto a, uh, a space that was known uh, because there are dimensions given in the Bible. So before uh, the rise of modern science, which we set in the 16th and 17th centuries, species actually had a term uh, which was general and also logical or philosophical, and so did genus, but they were used more or less um, interchangeably. People would, for, for reasons of style, they'd use species, and so as to not use the word many times in the one paragraph, the next time they might, might talk about genus, or they might, might talk about a shared nature and so forth. So it was a stylistic thing. In logic, it had a particular uh, meaning, that is, a kind or quality of an appearance or of a term, uh, if they wanted, as I said, they'd use species or genus. And the translators of the Vulgate, which is the Latin version of the Bible, in Genesis 1 through 4, interchangeably use species or genus. This doesn't mean they were talking about biological species. It means they're using a Latin word that we would say sort or kind or you know, form or something like that. Genus comes actually from a biological term, family or stock. Okay, so we can't assume because somebody uses um, a term, uh, the term species, that they're meaning what we think of as biological species. That was the mistake of the essentialist uh, story um, uh, creators like Meyer and Hull. They misread the logical text and general Latin texts as talking about biological species. So this guy is really interesting in the 17th century athanasius kircher sometimes referred to as the last man who knew everything um, he would write these extensive books um, on every topic i think it was something like 70 books in the end and he became the the sort of the summary of the knowledge of his day he published in 1675 a book called de arca noe um, Noah's Ark uh, as part of his works and he had to fit all of the species on the Ark and came up with 310 quadrupeds and around 60 or so bird species on the Ark, right? So where did all the new ones come from? Because they were starting to get a lot of these new specimens back from the New World, from uh, East Asia, India, the Indies, uh, from Africa and so on. And it was starting to bloom out. So they had a... Um, uh, a kind of solution to that. Uh, one, uh, one solution was hybridization of the existing species, forms new species, and the other is that certain sorts of organisms are spontaneously generated out of mud, so they didn't need to be on uh, the ark. Uh, of course, animals which didn't breathe, like fish, uh, didn't need to uh, be on the ark because they didn't have breath. All right. So this is um, the, the sort of view. Imagine that there was an original created cat kind. I've got this from a creationist site, uh, which is basically repeating what uh, people like Kircher were saying in the 17th century. And you get local variations of this kind caused by hybridization with other organisms and geographical adaptations. Um, now, the idea here wasn't that uh, there was a process of adaptation by selection, but that the local environment literally reshaped the organisms. But they were technically all from one premium species, one original kind. Right? This idea of hybridization is found in Aristotle's History of Animals, where he argues that because things are so hot in Africa, when all the animals go down to the water holes, they have to... Uh, cooperate or else they'll all die of thirst and this leads to matings between dogs and cats and so forth 
uh, and from that you get uh, uh, the different varieties. For example, the leopard, I think I've got that here, it's repeated in Pliny's Natural History, uh, and therefore, because Pliny's Natural History is the um, uh, encyclopedia used by educated Europeans for the next 2,000 years, uh, or 1,500 years or so, it's a widely held view. Um, so the giraffe was held to be a hybrid of the camel and the leopard. Hence the, t the name camelopard. Um, the leopard is a hybrid of a lion, Leo, and pardus. Now, pardus is a generic term for uh, an otherwise unremarkable large cat. Uh, so, you know, this is the, the, the view of where all the, what we would call species come from. They come from these premium species. So he had to be able to reduce the number of kinds that would get put onto the ark and in logic, there was a term called an infamous species. That is the lowest division of general things uh, that you can go, and underneath there's only the individuals, right? Um, for details, see my book. So what he could calculate the size and the logistics and the stores and what have you that would need to be on the ark, uh, and from that could work out how many species could be fitted. And this is what he came up with. The top level are the birds, the middle level are the, I think, small mammals, and the uh, lower level are the big mammals, like elephants and so forth. That's how he viewed the ark, and uh, here is a later uh, drawing of all the different animals. I would point out that up the top here, uh, the birds are, relative to the size of the elephants, very large indeed, or the elephants are very small. Uh, so there are the elephants, and there are the zebras. They're about the same size. So clearly there was a fair bit of fudging going on at this time. Basic or created kinds, he used the Latin term, which was species, and it was intended to be a matter of natural history uh, rather than simple theology. Now, why this was, counter-reformation of the Catholic Church had to deal with the literalism that was being proposed by Lutheran uh, uh, theologians at the time, and so they had to actually defend their interpretations. His source of information was likely Conrad Gesner. Many of you who've studied uh, history of biology will know about this guy. He was um, the first person to publish uh, many species with woodcut diagrams of them, right? And one famous one was done by Albrecht Dürer, uh, who was a Lutheran, as it happens. Uh, and there it is. That's his rhinoceros. Now, notice a few things. One is there's a single horn. Yeah, it's got armor rather than skin. It's got scales rather than skin down here. It's a, and it's got this funny little horn at the top here. Okay. This is how Kircher put the rhino into his, um, his own book. Uh, and as you can see, it's a very bad recutting of uh, uh, Gesner's uh, original woodcut. Now, neither Gesner nor Dürer had actually seen uh, this species. They were basing it on a drawing of a rhino that didn't survive being brought over from uh, Africa. But lots of the information about uh, the rhino was actually taken from explorers in India. And here is an Indian rhino, and you'll notice it has two horns, but the feet are pretty much like um, both Dura and uh, Kircher's versions. And you can see how they might have thought that there was armor when they've got this tough skin and the ribs showing through and so forth. It always pays to check your sources, something that people learned rather quickly after this period. So Kirk is trying to keep up with the latest natural history and at the same time keep his um, theology intact, so to speak. And he represents the final version of an older tradition that spans the bestiaries of the Middle Ages and modern natural history. And at that point, you're getting a, a change in inflection in natural history from the old medieval versions to the modern versions. Now... The invention of species in biology uh, was, the term was used just in a vernacular sense in the 1500s, but 
my namesake here, no close relation to Bishop John Wilkins, although uh, the other John Wilkins may be related, I don't know, uh, wrote an essay towards a real character in a philosophical language as part of what's come to be known as the Universal Language Project. And uh, his essay uh, formed the foundation for Ro uh, Roger's thesaurus. He tried to classify every word and term and concept of the day in a universal manner, right? Including a list of species drawn up by a botanist, John Ray. And John Ray found it so confining to put everything into Wilkins's categories. Uh, here, for example, is a, is a uh, uh, definition of species and genus. Uh, and here is uh, Wilkins's calculations on Noah's Ark as part of the same book. Ray found it so constraining that he actually went out and started collecting plants and did the very first full flora of a region, Cambridgeshire, and later of uh, the whole of the British Isles. Because he was uh, a little embarrassed of his part in Wilkins's um, essay. Now, uh, I just want to point out that diverse species of beasts, according to different kinds of food, this is a uh, a bill of lading, as it were. But if you have a look down the bottom, he says, I don't mention the mule. Why not? It's a mongrel production and not to be reckoned as a distinct species. That is to say, it's a hybrid. So it's not an original distinct species. And he also says that several variety of beefs, beeves, bisons, uh, buffalo, uh, and so on are actually geographical variants of the one species. So urus, and bisons and so forth. So he allows himself. Now, Ray had to come up with a definition of what it was that he was describing in his flora. And so he came up with this. I won't read the whole thing. But the, the bold is the text. No sure, sure criterion for determining species has occurred to me than the distinguishing features that perpetuate themselves in propagation from seed. He also says that this applies to animals. Now, I want you to notice there's a few things there. One is it's distinguishing features for the observer that are perpetuated in propagation from seed, that is, which are biologically reproduced. And I've called this the generative conception of biological species. And you find that this is the foundation for pretty much everybody else. But John Ray also is the guy who comes up with the notion that species are fixed, right? That God created the number of species in six days at the beginning and everything else thereafter are either hybrids or geographical variants. So Linnaeus didn't rely on uh, essentialism either. He didn't define them. He said things like species are most constant since their generation is a true continuation. And here you can see a formalized version of Linnaeus. Uh, and the famous saying there are as many varieties as there are different plants produced from the seed of the same species. Uh, and he also said that there are as many species as were created at the beginning. So it seems like Linnaeus is relying very heavily on Ray, and you can find some evidence of that in Linnaeus's writings. So, conclusion. The history of species is, to me, fascinating because it shows how scientific categories can evolve out of non-scientific categories. Uh, but it do, the present debates don't depend on history for their talking points, as it were. So we've got to stop interpreting the past in the light of the present issues and vice versa. In history, we call this Whiggism, the Whig interpretation of history, where we read back into the past the categories that we have today. But I want to point out, people weren't stupid or blind before Darwin. They were very good biologists and naturalists, and they were dealing with the empirical data that was coming to them. And they didn't be, people didn't suddenly become smart and observant after the publication of The Origin of Species uh, in 1859. Okay, for more details, buy my book or get your library to get a copy. There's the link. Um, there's history, philosophy, biology jokes and a very extensive bibliography, completely different from the first edition. And here are some other references. And if you're interested in knowing more about biological essentialism, Here's a couple of um, 
uh, very good essays by um, a very well-named person. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Thank you.